I'll start with an apology. I am the father of a four-month-old baby. So sleep has been <laughs> a very valuable commodity lately. So if you see me just pausing and looking out into the distance, it's, I'm just trying to. Uh, it's been hard. OK, so thanks, everyone, for showing up. This is, um, well, this was built as how to build Drupal applications with APIs and microservices. And as I was kind of preparing the slides, I realized it's probably misleading because it's, Drupal doesn't matter in that if you're using microservices the way you're using them, doesn't change because there's Drupal in the equation. And it's, it's, it's partly how to, but perhaps the, the more kind of um, important thing is why would you even use microservices? Um, and if you get those guiding principles, then it also doesn't matter what you call them, you call them microservices or something else. Um, so, obligatory survey. How many people are building things with microservices? Pretty good. And how many people are absolutely confident that what they're doing is microservices? <laughs> that's, that's me as well. Um, so, well, we'll see, we'll see where we get in terms of defining microservices. Um, I have to reveal a bias. So my background is in something called agent-based software engineering, which probably no one has ever heard of. Um, it's, it's partly kind of an obscure academic thing. And it's, it's about building um, communities of intelligent um, AI-enabled programs that communicate and collaborate and coordinate to solve problems. So I have a huge bias towards microservices because this is one possible definition of microservices. It's, uh, it's something that's capable of action. Maybe it's not flexible and autonomous, but it's capable of action in a dynamic environment that's unpredictable. And maybe it's not open in the sense that you can't just have new microservices joining the environment, but it's heterogeneous. There's lots of different things going on. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of biased. I really like these things. I get excited. Uh, not so much now because I just want to sleep. Um, <laughs> before we get into kind of the, the specifics, what, what is the issue? You know, why do we even care about microservices? What problems are we trying to solve? Uh, I guess the first problem is that we don't have a single problem, right? We have lots of different problems. And whenever we're building applications, we kind of have to um, figure out how all these different things are going to fit together, how they're going to communicate, how they're going to adapt over time. Um, and we need a way of architecting systems that helps us with that. So there's, there's a lot of things to build. The other problem we have is us, humans. Uh, I don't think I've ever been on a project where at some point the phrase this would have been fine just as long as X or Y or team X or Y behaved in a different way. Uh, there's always this kind of really hard integration problem in terms of getting different teams that are building different things to cooperate. Um, so microservices tries to solve this problem as well. It's not just um, kind of how do you build things in code, but it's how you build things in code where the people, uh, the, the things that are building the things are human beings. Once we get to the point where AI is building everything, it's going to be just fine. <laughs> but we're still not there. The other problem we have is speed. We want to release things quickly. Well, probably if the majority of us are developers, we don't necessarily care. But other people want us to release things quickly because of market concerns and so on and so forth. 
so how do we architect a system that lets us um, move quickly? Then we have the usual uh, scalability, resilience, availability issues. You want to scale horizontally, just add more copies of the same thing so that you can handle more of it. You want to scale uh, vertically, just use bigger machines and so on. And again, you need an architecture that's going to help with that. We need things that are testable. And there's, we kind of have, we need to make a distinction between testing individual classes or individual modules and testing a big complicated system that spans organizational boundaries uh, because there you get emergent behavior necessarily. Uh, and that level of complexity is really hard to test. It's, at times, it's, it's almost impossible. So the objective is just to get to a point where it gets as good as it can get. Right? So even though, essentially what I'm saying is, even though your code has 100% test coverage, you are still not testing the entire system because there's emergent behavior. So you need a better way of understanding your system. And then there's uh, the ability to replace things. Uh, and there's, there's two sides to this. There's replacing kind of components within your code, and that's fine. You want to take one thing out and put another thing in because there's a better, faster, clearer way of doing things. And you have to deal with people living, uh, the, the team, the organization, and kind of replacing who is actually working on the code so that we get out of this cycle that every time a new team moves in, they look at it and they say, we're, what the hell is this? We're just going to have to redo all of it. And, you know, I've done it plenty of times, so... Um, it's, it's how can you build a system that, even if the team is going to say that, the impact it's going to have to the overall system is smaller. Okay. So those are all our problems, and they're hard, big, complicated problems. Let's talk a bit about the non-microservice way as a, as a way of thinking of what is a microservice way. Um, it's, it's really either monoliths, you know, single applications, single code bases, or badly designed service-oriented architecture. And I'll let you in on a, on a, on a secret. There is no difference between a service-oriented architecture and microservices. It's just a different word. That's the difference. But <laughs> the reason the different word was required is as a way to group a set of principles and practices and patterns and we propose them and say we need to do this properly. We're still talking about service-oriented architectures. Um, but trying to implement them better. What, what are the problems with uh, monoliths or you know, badly designed service-oriented architectures? You have tight coupling. It's hard to support concurrency and partitioning if the boundaries of your system are not clear. You don't know what can run at the same time and kind of handle multiple tasks. You don't know how to partition it. Um, it's really hard to have efficient testing. And perhaps one of the biggest things, and uh, well, let's, let's do another survey. How many people have been in a room where the, the project manager or the, um, the solutions architect said, let's slow down because I'm not confident about what's going to happen after this release? Be honest. Wow, you're, you're extremely efficient. Like you've never had fear when you're releasing new code. Um, so, yeah. We need, to, we need to handle the human issues with, that mon monoliths don't um, help us with. Control. You know, who has control of this code base? Who is allowed to commit what, where, using what language, uh, what pattern, and so on? Um, reliability, consistency. 
it just accrues technical debt over time, inevitably. Um, and then it's so hard to pull that back. And it's, it's in, as it grows, it's increasingly harder to manage what this system is doing. So knowledge management becomes a huge issue. And just the, the simple truth is, you know, we've been building monoliths forever now. Um, and it rarely ends well. Big uh, applications that do a hundred thousand things are just end up breaking and they, we end up rebuilding them and so on and so forth. Um, so, what can you do? Well, there is the microservices way. And this is, this is a bit like the church of uh, the microservices, right? Welcome to the sermon. Um, it's, uh, it's a set of beliefs of that. <laughs> you, you just have to, uh, it's, it's more than that actually, we'll talk about it. But it's, it's, it's kind of, there is that need to constantly repeat to yourself, my system needs to abide by these principles. And you need to keep these principles in mind throughout. So what are the principles? Bounded context. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about bounded context, but what it means is every part of the system has a well-defined context within which it's going to operate and it's bounded. It cannot get out of that context. Um, do one thing well. And this is probably the most important thing with microservices and where the word micro comes from. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit unfortunate because micro makes people think, well, it's small, so I have to have small services. You don't need to have small services, but you need to have services that do just one thing well. Um, and usually that, this leads to smaller services. Right. But it's not smaller just because. It's smaller because they just do one thing. And it's also smaller because they actually have to be comprehensible. Uh, so if I look at a service, I should be able to understand it. Uh, without having to spend weeks working with it. They should be independently deployable. Right. So if, um, if I'm switching out a microservice, and that means I have to bring other things down, uh, you know, that's wrong. And so as you noticed, my, my presentation has a pattern. It's a word and an icon. Uh, just because I'm very lazy in terms of finding exciting pictures, because it's much simpler. But I was thinking, you know, what would be good for independently deployable? What represents independently deployable? And this is a satellite, <laughs> in case you haven't. Um, and it's, it, just imagine if, like, the, the, the Galileo um, uh, European Union system for GPS, right, which is, I think it's something like 30 satellites, was a monolith. And if you had to change it, you have to bring all the satellites down and launch 30 satellites up, right? That's what we're doing with our applications when we're building them as monoliths. We bring all the satellites down and we send new satellites up. That's a bad idea. So you need to be able to have satellites that fail and drop into the earth and burn up and you send new ones up and the system just recovers. Um, so as to be confident in terms of what you're doing, you need to be able to deploy through automated process builds. Right? So uh, it's, it's all part of the ingredients to the recipe that say, I'm happy with my system, I understand the individual components, and I'm, I'm happy to deploy, deploy often, uh, change without issues. Um, and for that, you need automation. And they're message-enabled. Right. So microservices communicate with each other by exchanging messages. And if you're thinking REST CRUD, 
we will get back to that. Because that's not what I mean. Finally, they should be composable. And that's partly an obvious one. You know, you should be able to um, use a number of different microservices together in order to achieve a goal. And they should encourage, encourage um, polyglotism. And I don't mean English and I just realized, I don't know what language this is. I was going to say Chinese, but uh, I don't actually know. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's, it's about allowing the individual teams to use whatever programming language they feel is the best for their microservice. So it's fine to have uh, PHP and Go and Haskell and you know, whatever is your flavor, whatever solves, uh, has the characteristics that solves your problem uh, in the right way. So overall, what we're building using the microservice principles is a system that makes change easy, safely, and at scale. And the scale is kind of important here because putting together a system that supports microservices is a lot of work. It's not about the individual microservices. There's no... You cannot build one microservice. That makes no sense. Uh, you're building a system that uses a number of different microservices together. So um, this is solving big problems, not small problems. Uh, and I often talk to developers and they're saying, ah, you know, we're using microservices, but they're like two people. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there might be reasons why you're doing that, but this is really about big problems rather than small problems. So, a system that makes change easy, safely, at scale. It has to be uh, a cohesive system. And this is, how many people uh, know Uncle Bob? Look him up. He will change your life. Um, one of the best kind of architects in uh, software engineering architects. So, what's a cohesive system? Gather together those things that change for the same reason, right, so that when you apply a change, you do it in one place, and separate those things that change for different reasons. Seems obvious, but that's not actually how we build systems. If your system is cohesive, it's also loosely coupled, right, because the individual things don't depend on each other. And that's uh, probably one of the, of the biggest things, right? So cohesion, loosely coupled. Any questions so far? Does this match the... the uh, those? Yeah. So you're saying about um, messages being uh, composable and poorly consistent, if that's a word. Um, does that mean that, by definition, you must be using something like ESP or SVQ in order to do that? You said uh, not so much REST or PRO. So what would be the alternative if it's two projects, uh, two small projects, be using it those areas? It's it's not REST CRUD as one thing. It can be REST. That's fine. Um, CRUD is a different thing, and we we often conflate them. As in, I'm building a REST service. Okay, so you can create, read, update, and delete. It's not necessarily that way. Uh, in terms of um, the, well, we'll talk about how microservices communicate, and it's, um, um, it doesn't matter in what programming language you write them. Yeah. It matters, obviously, in what they use to exchange messages between themselves, uh, but they're services, so... I just realized I was probably one slide ahead here. Anyway, that's fine. How do we build microservices? What does the architecture uh, look like? We talked a bit about this, but I'll just repeat it. It's not about the size of the service. There's characteristics you want to hit. Uh, it should do one thing well. It should be comprehensible. That's probably going to lead to smaller things. But don't get hung up on, oh, this this is big or this is small and so on. It's 
It does one thing and it's comprehensible. Um, or it's 42. It's, if you're architecting uh, a system using the microservices way, it's not just about the service. Right? That's one of the components. You're really dealing with everything. So um, the individual services, the overall architecture and solution, how the organization works. You actually need to ensure that the organization that you're developing the solution for is capable of dealing with uh, microservices, with the ability to change things quickly. There's not necessarily, um, I don't know, a CTO or someone else that says, no, everything is going to be done in absolutely the same way. Right, so there's, there's culture issues there that you need to uh, make sure are addressed. Otherwise, the system is just not going to work. And it's, uh, to me, it's, it's unfortunate because really I would like to get on with the services and the solution, right? The, the interesting stuff. But unless you solve this annoying stuff, the human stuff, the rest is just not going to work. So um, it's just how it is. And then obviously you need your processes and your tooling to be able to handle microservices. The next thing I would suggest is read this book, Domain Driven Design. Probably one of the biggest travesties that um, educational institutions that teach computer science perform is teach us to normalize databases. You should just stop doing that because it makes us think that that's a really important system characteristic and you have to have the one canonical model of your problem starting from the database working uh, your way up. Instead, what domain-driven design says is actually, if you look at an organization, there are overlapping models of the same thing. So in this case, what it's trying to say is there's two models of product and two models of customer. They overlap, right? They talk about some of the same things, but other things are different. And if you try to create a single model, it's not going to be good enough for the sales context, and it's not going to be good enough for the support context. So what it's suggesting you do is you define two bounded contexts. One sale, the other is support. They communicate through a clear set um, uh, of APIs, but they can have overlapping models. Right? Where this information is stored is not our problem. Uh, what's important is that Within the system, they can do what they need. Within the system, they can do what they need. And they can exchange information. And this is, it takes some time because we are really used to, uh, here's a problem. Okay, I'm going to have a customer table. And then there's going to be a product table. And it's going to have these things. And, and it's not necessarily the right way. Um, this might sound weird, but it's actually... Um, it's a perfectly valid architecture strategy to design a monolith and then break it up. And the reason you're designing a monolith is to learn about your system, to learn what actually makes sense. And then you break it up into microservices because this stuff is hard. It's, there is no right or wrong answer. So you, you need to really get into your system and learn it. Um, once a test you need to continuously apply is if you um, if you're applying a change and you end up touching different microservices because of this change we've done it wrong right we need to go back to the drawing table and rethink what our co what our bounds are what the context is uh, because it's not uh, coupled loosely This goes back to what I was saying before. Don't start by designing data models. Right. Focus on business capabilities. What, is, uh, what are we actually trying to do? 
you know, a customer buys things, a customer has a complaint, um, something needs to be shipped from A to B. Those are our problems. Uh, how the data is going to eventually look once it's stored somewhere is later down the line. Right. And that's why REST CRUD is, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, <laughs> you, can, you can do that. And the fact, I don't know, like uh, Drupal has uh, CRUD uh, APIs, that's fantastic. It can be very useful. But if you're building a big system with uh, lots of different microservices, this is not your objective. Your objective is not to build something where you can say, um, put uh, this change in this database table you know, using this API and so on. It's, you might end up there in certain cases, but not always. Right, so uh, don't just assume, well, what I'm going to do is find my entities, uh, rest crowd on top of it, and hey, I have an API now. You, you don't really, you just have a way to read and write data. And I'm making the point again. I delay, because this is where a lot of the source of the coupling comes from. Uh, delay dependency on data stores right to the end. Uh, build interfaces, build models, build, build mock replies and so on. Um, Robert Martin has has a great story about this. They started building this wiki system and they, they just kept delaying where they were actually going to store the pages. Like they built the whole thing, it was working, but they had no data store. And in the end, they realized that the simplest thing, which was text space, was the data store they were going to go with, um, sorry, file kind of text space, as opposed to the usual thing you, you, you would do as a MySQL database or something like that. Now, we're not database administrators. Right? We are software engineers and we're solving problems in the real world as opposed to kind of data storage problems. If eventually you're going to have data storage, don't have your microservices point to the same database. You just pointed everything to kind of a single um, model and you've coupled them all together now. Uh, so just be, and we'll see an example of that, so I'll, I'll get back to it. But is everyone in agreement or are you just thinking, what the hell? In agreement? Excellent. How do we integrate our microservices? We said it's going to be message-based. And um, this is a great quote from Alan Kay that uh, was uh, in some message board. Right? Alan Kay, fundamental to object-oriented design. Uh, I'm sorry that I coined the term objects because people focus on objects. The really interesting idea is messages. You have individual things, and sure, they have their attributes and their internal structure and so on, but the way they communicate with each other is through messages. Another quote. For far too long, developers have viewed APIs and web services as tools to transmit serialized objects. And if we've done an API, we've, kind of, we've all done it, and there's so many frameworks out there that say, hey, I'm just going to serialize all your objects so you don't need to worry about your API. Uh, but that's not really solving our problem because we're not properly defining the bounds and the, the domain problem. We're just sending data around and then we need to figure out what to do with it still. Uh, so we need to look at it as services exchanging messages. And within that message, you're going to have some data. That's fine. Um, but don't just think as long as you can send the entire uh, kind of um, row of a table as JSON over to the other side, you're done. That's fine. Now, there's, there's any number, if we can get to the lower level of how you actually exchange data, 
there's any number of ways to do this, and there is no right or wrong way as long as it works for you. And I'll just give you an example. Um, so Netflix, which is one of the organizations that has really gone all in with microservices, is uses um, three protocols internally, and those are all uh, protocols that are far more efficient in terms of um, how they, they package data. And then it uses JSON over HTTP uh, for external consumers. Uh, and JSON over HTTP is, you know, is, is perfectly fine. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and just think a, a bit more before you, you build an application, is um, do you just want to send kind of um, standard JSON uh, that uh, re represents uh, a bit of data, or use something like HeyOS. How many people know what this is or used it, actually used it, let's say? <coughs> cool. So HeyOS is um, <laughs> a terrible acronym, but it's Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State. And essentially, the, the idea behind it is, it says if we're only sending uh, kind of the, the result or something, if we're sending just a specific message, uh, we're not giving you any information of what you can do with this thing or what should you do next. Right? A developer still needs to go and look at the API documentation and figure out what else they can do. This is essentially embedding information about what you can do with the thing that I've just sent you. So, and and it's, it's, it's using the, the hypermedia uh, principle of essentially links. So here's the message, and here's some things that if you follow them, um, you know, these are the things that you can do next, or you can do with this message, and so on. Uh, so it's, it's a really powerful way of doing your messaging. It's also quite complex, and it's not necessarily always required. Again, it's about kind of scale and uh, where things exactly fit. The other thing to be thinking about is event sourcing. Right? And this has nothing to do with microservices specifically. It's just a way of keeping track of what's going on in your application and sharing data. And it's what financial institutions have been doing forever. So this is understood really well. Right? So uh, the simplest example is kind of your, your bank statement. Right? The bank don't just store this, which is the final result. Your balance is seven pounds. Banks store all the transactions, the, all the ways that your bank uh, balance has changed. And uh, that's how you can figure out where the data is right now. And you get all sorts of benefits in terms of you can always replay things. Uh, you can play them in different ways to see what happens and so on. So think about whether as you're exchanging information between microservices, what you want to be exchanging is a series of events about how things are changing versus just a structural data model. Right? So series of events, just the result. And again, it one may be more appropriate than the other, depending on um, what's the situation you're trying to solve. Another thing to be thinking about, and this is, you kind of see <laughs> the span of uh, the microservices way, is, is really there's all these practices and patterns, right? Um, and it's putting all this together. So instead of just um, one service sending a message to another service, what you can do is use an events hub. Right? So you, uh, a service says, hey, this happened. Someone just ordered something. Right? Or a package has arrived. That's what that service does. It does one thing, and it just publishes. I know that this thing happened. Then you can have a number of other services that subscribe to the, that events help and say, oh, a package just arrived. Okay, I'm the marketing 
service. And what I'm going to do is email the user to say, um, congratulations, you know, you've received your, your thing, or how do you think about your thing, and so on. So there's no direct interaction between the two services, but they still coordinate to solve a problem because one of them is one of them is saying um, something happened, and everyone else is reacting to it. Okay. Which leads on to how you get your microservices to achieve something together. And there's two uh, basic principles. Well, there's many more, but these are the two most important ones. Are you doing choreography, or are you doing orchestration? Right. So, orchestration is there's a single conductor, and it's telling each microservice what to do. And that's kind of not a good idea. Um, if you're doing choreography, it's, uh, the, the reason they call it choreography is because it's like a bunch of different dancers, and each one is reacting to the movement of the other one, right? Um, so there's no central control, they're just reacting to each other. Okay, now let's look at, so I have nine minutes, maybe eight, let's look at a small example. Uh, so I'll have to go fast. Okay, here's the problem. We have a hotel booking service. It has availability. It knows when rooms are available and when they're not. There's a bunch of channels that sell that hotel's availability as well. Right? This is your booking.com, hotel.com, and so on and so forth. Our problem is we need to synchronize the two. So when someone books over here, um, we need to tell all of these people We've booked, right? There is uh, there is no availability from this day to this day, and this is this is a real problem, right? This is um, something that we've built. Um, so those those are my contexts. In a way, we talked about bounded contexts. <coughs> well, one solution is to just place um, something here a module, whatever, that knows how to talk to each one of those, and it will update them. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily. Looks like a good idea, right? Um, each channel has a different API, by the way. So what, why is this maybe not a good idea? Well, I can't add a channel without redeploying the entire Drupal site because I have to add more functionality. I, and actually, I don't have one Drupal site. I'm managing about you know, a few hundred Drupal sites for a few hundred different hotels. So it's, it's a real issue. Um, if a channel changes, I need to redeploy everything again. Um, if I have 50 channels, this Drupal site is going to go crazy trying to uh, communicate and make sure it did all the right things with all the individual channels. So even though I have services here, it's still not a good solution. So what could I do? Step one. What our Drupal site is going to do is become an event producer. And it's just going to send events to a message queue. Uh, we use uh, the Amazon message queue. Uh, saying, hey, availability has changed. Right, problem solved. I send information. I've still, though, coupled Drupal to some queue, to some specific implementation of a queue, and I will still need to redeploy based on changes. And you, you, at this point, you can make a decision whether that's fine or not. Uh, in our case, we thought, no, this is, this is not good enough. So what we actually did is we built a very simple um, service, microservice, um, that just knows how to uh, get messages from this Drupal application and put them in a queue. And that's it. So every time availability changes, 
we send a message, and uh, uh, that little Silex app puts it in the right queue. And now I can actually start, uh, you know, if I get a lot of sites, I can easily kind of scale that. I've solved a few problems. Next step. Well, because we're still not sending it to the channels, right? There's just a message that says something has changed. So now there's another service called the channel manager that picks up messages from the queue. And I'm, I'm hiding kind of a few steps of complexity here. But essentially, the end result of that is that it's going to talk to a number of individual services, each one specializing in how each one of the channels um, uh, deals with availability. Yeah. So what I've done is I've completely separated my problems now. I can uh, um, change my Drupal site uh, without any issues. Um, I can have more channels or fewer channels, and as channels change the way they want to accept information, I can do that separately, and all of this can be scaled. There is one uh, problem. In doing all of this, information might have changed. So, say there was a booking here at 0, 01 second, and it went to the queue, and then there's another booking at 0, 02 seconds, and, but by the time I process my queue, uh, I didn't actually, um, I kind of lost that information, right? Uh, so if what we're sending the queue is the actual change, by the time we get to process that change, it might no longer be valid. So what we're actually doing is uh, using, telling the channel manager, your job is to go see if there is a change, and if there is, go ask the site what change that is. So we've, we've separated that bit of responsibility as well. So the only thing the queue knows is something changed. I don't know what it is. By the time we get to process it, if, say, there was a change uh, from the 20th to the 25th of the, of the month, there was a booking, and then that booking changed, so it's from the 20th to the 24th, uh, by the time I get to ask the site, when I actually ask the site, I'm going to get the latest information. Right? So I've, I've kind of sort of solved that problem. And again, there's, there's more issues here. I'm trying to simplify. And we do that via a gateway so that we don't actually need to know how to talk to Drupal sites. So that's, that's kind of, there's two issues here. On the one hand, wow. Well, We've changed the system and solved a whole bunch of problems, and we can actually scale and do all sorts of interesting things. On the other hand, crap. Like, I had one side in channels, and look at all this mess. Like, I have to manage all of this now. And that's where actually having an ecosystem that can manage and monitor all of this becomes important. But you need that tool yet. Because it's kind of, it's one or the other, right? Um, so it's, it's a simpler system in many different ways, but you need a lot of tooling to manage it. We are very lucky right now because we get all this functionality for free with cloud-based services. And actually, the, the next iteration of this solution uh, uses Lambda functions from uh, AWS, and Lambda functions are fantastic because I don't need a listener. I just need Amazon to fire up a little function and do its thing, and then it dies away, and it can scale until S3 breaks, and then everything breaks. But. Okay, I'm finishing. What next? I didn't talk about testing, monitoring, security, API gateways. Um, I'll share the slides. Go get these books, read them, read up on APIs, and so on. And I have to do my favorite slide. Just going to take one minute. Here's what we need to do. And I'm going to read these things. Make each program do one thing well. To do a new job, build
build up fresh rather than complicate old programs by adding new features. Expect the output of every program to become the input to another, as yet unknown, program. Do not clutter output with extran extraneous information. Avoid stringently columnar or binary input formats. Don't insist on interactive input. Design and build software, even operating systems, to be tried early, ideally within weeks. Don't hesitate to throw away the clumsy parts and rebuild them. Use tools in preference to unskilled help to lighten a programming task. Even if you have to detour to build the tools and expect to throw some of them out after you've finished using them. So who knows where this comes from? 1978, the Bell Labs Unix time sharing system documentation. 2017, we're still trying to learn these things. Cool, done. Questions? Just a quick one on your um, solution. Um, uh -oh. that there was, you still seem to be having, sorry, I didn't mean to implant a lot of the solution. Um, <laughs> you still seem to have uh, t you have the message uh, queue being um, interacted with by both the listener and the channel manager, and you said, "Don't share your database. Don't share your data store." Is that why you're now using the, that? the message queue? Is not a data store though. It just yeah. says something changed. It's an event hub oh, okay. as opposed to a data. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll let you on. Next. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, so you said at the beginning, Microsoft. Services for solving big problems, um, and it's mostly about where there's maybe hundreds of developers in a big organization that's getting it all together. How much do you think can be applied? Um, so, in my case is we're in a small team, we've got a customer website that does e commerce, talks to several different external services. I wonder how much do you think it makes sense to apply much services ideas? I think to a certain extent it does. So, for example, this is actually a small problem in the sense that this is really a SaaS platform problem and this is being built by, uh, or originally it was like seven or eight people. Right? It's, it's more the characteristics of the problem you have and usually it's about the bigger teams but not necessarily. If you're interacting with a lot of different external internal services then uh, it makes sense. Anything else? You're all believers in the microservice way. You have to look at the specifics and think about your, um, where you're exchanging data. And it's, it's like that. So for example, the delay we have, we fixed it by going straight to the site as opposed to saving the data. Right? So that... that right, so you, you, change, you kind of change the yeah. architecture slightly to fit the needs of the same. Yeah, to minimize, to minimize the, how fresh the data we're actually getting is. But then you have to look at each single problem and say, you know, what are the tools at my disposal here? And maybe some of those tools are literally hardware or networking specific, and that I mean, uh, you know, you dictate some latency uh, to minimum or maximum latency and so on. Some of them are kind of software things. I totally did not answer, but there is no, 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 no answer. <laughs> Um, have you found it challenging to create this kind of much larger ecosystem? Yes. It's, um, yeah. So uh, the initial QA was we were getting Slack messages on everything. <laughs> and then looking at the Slack messages, we realized how we can build monitoring systems that ask the right questions. Because the problem is, 
there, there is emergent behavior, in a, even in a system as small as this. And uh, unless you actually see it, and it's hard to, to know in advance what to... You can test the individual things, and you know that the individual things are doing what they're supposed to do, but what's going to come up as a result is uh, you, you kind of need to see it. Okay, thank you. Jason, Jason P. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah, so it's essentially you can package the message yeah. and then you have the link and you have the actions. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. one way to do it. Okay, I just wanted to check the rules. No, è vero, è vero. Io lavoro da casa, sono nato, perdo un buon anno.